abundantly far more than we could ever ask or imagine, Paul says. That's what God has in store for us. That's, that's the journey to which Jesus calls his followers. Now again, we've, we've jumped ahead a few chapters in the Gospel of Luke from last week. Jesus' disciples, his message bearers, as the First Nation translation calls them, they've just returned from being sent out in twos by Jesus to take what they've heard from Jesus and proclaim it themselves, to take what they've seen him do and do it themselves. They've just gotten back from that commission. Now, this imitation of Jesus is at, at the heart of the ancient concept of discipleship, right? That is, these, these guys aren't just hanging out with Jesus for an hour or so once a week. They don't just listen to his stories and teachings and then go about the rest of their lives. Their entire lives are oriented around and devoted to him and the way that he is teaching them. They are like super apprentices. Right? As such, their goal, their, their training is not merely to listen and hear Jesus' messages for themselves, but to internalize it so deeply that they can go out and imitate him. That when they're on their own, they can effectively communicate and do what Jesus himself would say and do. That's the goal. And so they've just returned from their first commission, and apparently they didn't do half bad. And yet, for all their faithfulness, all that they have understood and done well, Luke makes it clear that, that his followers still don't seem to have understood what the light of the world is revealing to them, what, who he is, really, and what, what it really means to follow him, right? They've got that, that first level of understanding down, but Jesus seems to know their limits. And so while he initially sets off to be alone with them and to, to reconnect after their journeys, when the crowds see and follow them, Jesus seizes the opportunity to call them into that higher level, that next level of understanding who he is what his mission is, what it, what it means really to be his message bearer. Now they go with Jesus thinking it's just more of the same, right? Jesus is doing his usual round of teachings, healings, explaining things to the people. They've seen this before, right? But really, as we find out, this is all just a prelude to the main act. The sun is setting. The disciples are beginning to grow concerned. Uh, Jesus, sorry to interrupt your sermon, but uh, I don't know if you've realized it's getting dark. And uh, we're stranded in a deserted place with thousands of hungry families. That feels like it's maybe not a great combination. Probably time to wrap things up. Yeah? Yeah? I mean, if we go now, we should be able to, to reach the neighboring villages and, and find some food there. What do you say? It's a pretty reasonable action plan, if you ask me. Yeah? But apparently Jesus isn't very reasonable. Oh, that's not necessary, he says. You feed them. Uh, do you know something we don't? Because all we can see are five loaves of bread and a couple of fish. Ah, unless you want us to go buy some food and bring it back for the people, that must be it. Again, seems like a pretty reasonable action plan, although I'm not exactly sure how you haul a few 12 disciples haul food for 5,000 people, but that's besides the point. And we know how the rest of the story goes, right? Jesus takes those few loaves and, and fish and multiplies them. The masses not only eat until they're full, but... There are 12 baskets left over. Now, depending on the kind of church you attend, there are usually two main ways that, that we are invited to understand this story. One way is that Jesus literally multiplies the loaves and fish. The point being, the emphasis being, that if we believe such miracles are, are not only possible, but to be expected, well, then we can also expect such nature-defying miracles in our own lives if, it's a big if, 
if we have enough faith to believe, which means if that nature-defying miracle doesn't happen for you, it's probably your own fault, and you need to pray a little bit harder. I'm not personally a fan of that one, but maybe it's just me. The second way is that this story lifts up what, what happens when we share. Right? Jesus starts with what he has, and inspired by his generosity, everyone reaches into their pocket like the offering plate is going around, and lo and behold, the collection is more than enough. The point being the value of sharing and the call to be generous. That seems good enough. In both interpretations, the act of multiplying the loaves becomes the sole focus, which I think if we look closer at the text, actually ends up distracting from the larger context and missing, missing the actual invitation to a deeper understanding, that, that real challenge that Jesus is presenting for his followers then and now. At the heart of this story are followers of Jesus who have already been sharing in his ministry and teaching, right? They've not only been with Jesus as he's healed and taught people, they've, they've also been with him during other miracles. And again, they've, they've just returned from being sent out to, to gather their own crowds on hillsides and to share Jesus' teachings and perform miracles. That's nothing new. So the miracle itself really isn't the unprecedented thing. It's not really the point for them or for us. Instead, the deeper challenge, the more difficult challenge, I think, is lies in the context outside of the miracle. And in fact, before the miracle even takes place. Again, the people are gathered in a deserted place. The other Gospels more explicitly say they are gathered there in the wilderness. That is, they are gathered with a multitude of hungry people in a place of barrenness. In a place where the survival of flora and fauna itself is made possible by their ability to go long periods without food or water. Right? Deserted places are abandoned places. God is not there. In fact, the wilderness is that place where their ancestors wandered for 40 years after being liberated from bondage in Egypt, seemingly stuck there in a season of disorientation between their past in Egypt and their promised future on the other side of the Jordan, suspended in that wilderness place. It can seem like a pretty crappy place to be. The disciples are likely themselves exhausted, right? They've just returned from their long journeys, and now they're not only gathered in a deserted place with thousands of hungry people, but the sun is setting. They're understandably getting anxious and stressed out, and perhaps all the more agitated because Jesus doesn't seem to be concerned at all. But while their anxiety and fear are quite natural and understandable, the challenge, as Jesus makes clear, is that it begins to shrink their imagination and shape their judgment about what's possible. Followers of Jesus are called not to merely be reasonable within the world's way of thinking and doing things, right? Which is largely defined by narratives of scarcity and anxiety. There's, there's not enough to go around. Not enough jobs, not enough food, not enough water. And so we enact measures and policies and restrictions based on there not being enough. That's what shapes our world. And according to Jesus, this scarcity mentality is a myth. It's an illusion that we've, we've trained ourselves to see, but not a reflection of reality. Instead, instead the light of the world reveals to us that we are called to imagine 
new possibilities grounded in the truth, the reality of abundance. We are invited to acknowledge our fears in the wilderness, but to keep them from defining what's real, what's possible, what, what we can do and, and who we can become. Because what's really real, what's really possible is that the God who is at work within us is capable of abundantly far more, way, way more than we could ever dare to even ask or imagine. The multiplication of loaves and fish, however it happened, is in service of this vision, which we are called to live by. This vision is the point. And again, if we're honest, I think it's much, a much greater challenge for us than the miracle itself. Think about your own lives for a moment. Your own season, past or present, where it felt like you were wandering in a disoriented state, in the wilderness, where you felt stranded in a deserted place, wondering how you were going to make it through these, this time, these struggles. Wondering, when is this going to end? How long until we're on the other side? How easy and understandable it is in such places in our own lives to be, to be overcome like the disciples with, with anxiety and to see only scarcity and to therefore revert to those patterns, those habits, those relationships, those communities that are familiar, even if unhelpful, rather than taking that risk, risking that possibility of newness, of, of healing beyond them, by opening ourselves to something new. It's right there in this place of dis desertion, of scarcity and anxiety. This, this is not where God is most absent, but where Jesus meets us with the truth of abundance. Not apart from this place, but right in the middle of it. We are not passive recipients of a miracle. No, with a smile of encouragement and trust, Jesus looks at us like he did to the disciples and says, you see this bread and fish? You, feed the people. I know that you see scarcity and that it's hard to believe it's possible, but I'm telling you, there is enough. But the only way to know is to act on it. The same is true for us as a church. The same is true for churches around the globe. The pandemic has made inescapable what was true long before it. That the church, despite being somewhat adept at that first level of understanding of Jesus' invitation, like the disciples, right, of, of sharing with and caring for our neighbors, well, we mistook what we were doing for the whole thing, for the real goal. We got comfortable with the way that we were doing things and, and fairly good at doing them over and over again. But in the process, we never really stopped to ask, well, if God might not in fact be calling us to stop doing some of those things, to let go of how we've always done things in order to discover the abundantly far more than we could ever ask or imagine that God is calling us to now. And this latter invitation is exciting, right? It's full of possibility, but we also have to acknowledge, like the disciples, that it, it's anxiety-inducing. Change always is. And to accept it, is like the disciples, like our ancestors in the faith, to admit that we are in a season of disorientation. 
that like them we find ourselves in the wilderness. But as scripture reminds us, these places, disorientation, the wilderness, such seemingly deserted places, rather than being abandoned, are actually precisely where God meets us with abundantly far more than we could ever ask or imagine. Far more than would be possible if we just kept, kept, the, kept things going on the conveyor belt the way they have been. Those deserted places in our lives, the disoriented seasons in which we might find ourselves as a church, they're not merely ones to escape or wait out. It is precisely here that God desires to make us new, to transform us. And in fact, all transformation takes place here. To simply wait it out or or to return to normal, or just continue with what's familiar, is to forego the possibility of any real transformation. Again, this is precisely where we are at this stage in the pandemic and in our journey of revitalization here at Federated. Being remade, our vision being transformed, expanded, here in this wilderness. My prayer is that we know God's blessings. We would know God's blessings in, in those deserted places here as a community and that you may know them in your own life for your healing, for the healing and flourishing of all creation. May it be so. Mm -hmm.